The Castel Marise War for control of the American Mafia officially ended when Lucky Luciano led a conspiracy with his fellow gangsters to assassinate the new boss of bosses, Salvatore Maranzano. But rather than assume the title that he just caused to become recently vacant, he set up a new American-inspired structure of a board of directors for organized crime. They called it the Commission, and its role was to mediate and settle disputes between America's 21 recognized crime families. It was established with seven members, who were the most powerful bosses in the country. It centered around the five families of New York, while Buffalo and Chicago were also given seats. In this video, we will explore who all seven of the original Commission members were. Some had incredibly short tenures, while others held their position for decades. A few were well documented because they were famous during their lifetimes, while others managed to stay out of the limelight and we know little about them today. But all of them had one thing in common, a ruthless ambition that brought them to the top. But before we get started, please take a moment to click the like button and hit subscribe. Your support is greatly appreciated. And now let's dive into who were the original Mafia Commission. What separated the new generation of American mafioso from the old one that fell from power in the aftermath of the Castella Marise War was a willingness to work with other Americans that were outside of the Italian community. Lucky Luciano was the biggest victor from that gang war, where he was propelled from mid-level lieutenant into the boss of the most powerful family. He was born in 1894 and given the name Salvatore. As a teen, he would adapt the American name Charlie. The nickname Lucky would come later after surviving an assassination attempt that left him wounded with a droopy eye that never healed. He immigrated from Sicily to the United States in 1906 and the family settled in the Lower East Side. While this area was home to a large Italian community, it also featured significant Irish and Jewish populations which made it a cultural melting pot. While his parents were hardworking and honest, Luciano chose to go on a different path. At age 14, he dropped out of school to sell hats on the streets. It has later been suspected that this business was a front to sell illegal drugs hidden inside the legitimate products. He went on to join the Five Points Gang, founded by fellow Italian Paolo Antonio Vaccarelli, who later adopted the name Paul Kelly. This gang was more Americanized than other gangs founded by Italians, as it worked directly with the Democrats of Tammany Hall to aid their power in exchange for turning a blind eye to their activities. They also incorporated smaller Irish and Jewish gangs into their ranks, which made them unique through being diverse. Almost immediately, Luciano set himself apart from the other delinquents his age by thinking outside of the box. While the others were out committing petty crimes for money, Luciano created a protection racket for the Jewish kids in the neighborhood. They would pay him 10 cents a week in exchange not to be bothered by the Irish or Italian kids. One day he met a boy who refused to pay named Meyer Lansky. The two boys developed respect for each other, which turned into a friendship that lasted well into their adulthood. In the Five Points Gang, Luciano met many future mobsters who would rise to power with him, like Johnny Torrio, Al Capone, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, and more. He also caught the eye of Joe the Boss Masseria, who had just became leader of the former Morello crime family, the first true mafia organization in New York. Through Meyer Lansky and his other Jewish friends, Luciano also met the famous Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein was primarily a gambler, but he was also a gangster who was able to mingle with American high society. The other man became his mentor by teaching him how to speak, how to dress, and how to act. With financing through Rothstein, Luciano set up a bootlegging operation with Costello and Genovese that would go on to generate millions of dollars. Rothstein was murdered in 1928 during a gambling dispute, where he refused to name the man who shot him to the police as he laid on his deathbed. Rothstein did not have a sophisticated network where someone else could just take his place and his operation faded with them. But the lessons he left to Luciano and the others became the foundation foundational knowledge for the new mafia that would emerge in 1931. With Rothstein gone, Luciano became closer to Joe the Boss, and it became clear to him that the man was poorly educated with bad manners and limited managerial skills. These were traits that a vicious demeanor could not make up for. During the Castella Marise War, he became Joe's top lieutenant until he betrayed the boss and took over the family. Following that, he assassinated Salvatore Maranzano before the former could do the same to him. With the younger generation of mafiosa supporting him, Maranzano's allies were purged through either murder or forced retirement. Luciano could have easily called himself the next boss of bosses, but instead he proposed the creation of the commission, so that power could be more evenly shared between families instead of concentrated in the one man. Before he died, Maranzano established many rules for the mafia, including the procedures for becoming a main man. This meant that his Jewish friend Meyer Lansky could never become an official member, though Lansky would always serve as a trusted advisor. Luciano worked on consolidating his own power in the family by recruiting his allies into leadership positions. At the same time, he used his powerful influence with the commission to make sure New York remained peaceful. Unlike the other bosses, Luciano did not hide himself from public view. 
He lived in the suite at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where he became a minor celebrity. Following the heated castella Marise War in the Prohibition years, many prominent Mafia members were known to law enforcement, while this new era for doing business required secrecy. Murder was to be used only when absolutely necessary, and families preferred to distance themselves from the actual deed. Mancano family underboss, Albert Anatasia, was selected to be the contact between the commission and a group of Jewish gangsters that the press would later call Murder Inc. This would give Anatasia the later nickname of Lord High Executioner. Things would remain peaceful and stable until 1935 when the commission had its first test. Jewish gangster Dutch Schultz, who had a criminal organization that has sometimes been called the Six Family, was under investigation by Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey. Schultz wanted to murder Dewey in order to have the investigation called off, an action that the commission believed would have the exact opposite effect of bringing the full wrath of law enforcement. When the commission told him he couldn't do this, he told him to fuck off. So they killed him. Ironically for Luciano, with Schultz gone, he became Dewey's next target through an investigation in the prostitution and organized crime. Investigators made a sweeping raid on February 12, 1936 on dozens of brothel locations in New York City, and more than 100 women were arrested. They were taken to court instead of being released, where bail was set at $10,000, an amount that none of them could afford. As they rotted in jail, many of the women decided to cooperate with law enforcement, and they painted a picture where the whorehouses were ran by the Luciano family. Some women even claimed that Lucky Luciano himself went in person to collect the money from these places. In hindsight, the idea that the most powerful mafia boss in America was going in person to collect his cut from the brothel seems far-fetched, since we now understand that part of the purpose of the structure of organized crime was to shield the boss from the crimes committed by his underlings. But regardless, Luciano was arrested in April of 1936, and his trial was held the following month. Luciano was accused of running an organization which controlled a massive prostitution ring that Dewey called the Combination. Though it's more likely that the Luciano family's involvement in the oldest profession in the world was collecting protection money from the women and their madams to keep violent men and the police away. Luciano could not explain in his trial why his lifestyle exceeded his tax return. That, combined with his arrest record and known criminal associations, did not make him look like an upstanding citizen. Luciano testified in his own defense and Dewey exposed him as a liar. In the end, Luciano was convicted on 36 counts of compulsory prostitution, and he was sentenced to between 30 and 50 years in state prison. Luciano was sent to the Clinton Correctional Facility in upstate New York, so that he could be as physically far from New York City as possible. But he managed to run his family while being behind bars, with Vito Genovese as the acting boss. Genovese would flee the United States in 1937 after being charged with murder and Frank Costello then replaced him. During World War II, the United States government was nervous about sabotage on the New York docks, and they made a deal with the Mafia for the underworld to keep an eye out and prevent foreign spies from doing any harm. In addition to helping their country as a patriotic duty, the Mafia also managed to negotiate a release for Luciano following the end of the war. In 1946, Luciano's nemesis, Thomas Dewey, was now governor of New York State. He agreed to commute the sentence in exchange for Luciano being deported back to Italy and never to return. Because Luciano didn't bother to become an American citizen, this was easily done. As he left, he stepped down formally as the boss, and Costello replaced him. Over the next decade, it was clear that prison did not reform Luciano. He was majorly involved in the sale and smuggling of narcotics from Europe to America. After World War II, Vito Genovese returned to New York and rejoined his family under Costello's leadership. He quietly bided his time, and in 1957, he attempted a hostile takeover. An assassination plan almost took out Costello, and this close call made the boss decide to retire. Genovese became the new boss, and the power on the commission shifted from him and away from Luciano. As he grew older and became isolated, Luciano's power waned. In 1962, he died of a heart attack in the Naples airport. He didn't have any children and went to his grave hating Thomas Dewey for exposing him to the world as a gangster. Out of all the members of the original commission, with the exception of Al Capone, whose tenure was very short, the one boss that we know the most about is Joseph Bonanno. This is in large part because, after being forced into retirement in the 60s following a failed power play, he later broke Omerta and wrote a tell-all memoir. And even though the book he wrote about his life is detailed, we should also remember that his goal was to make himself look as good as possible to the public, and he should be considered an unreliable narrator. While he thought that he was not admitting to any crimes where he or anyone else could be prosecuted, this book served as the basis for Rudy Giuliani's federal case against the bosses of the New York families in the Mafia Commission trial, which put the heads of four out of the five families and their underbosses in prison for life. Bonanno was born in the Castel Marise del Golfo region of Sicily in 1905. He spent part of his childhood in Brooklyn before his family returned back to Italy. As a boy, he was unsure of what exact career he would pursue, but he knew that he wanted to be a commander of men. 
As a young man, he enrolled in the Merchant Marine Academy, but fled Italy in 1924 due to fascism and returned to the United States. He tried his hand working as a baker's apprentice before realizing that it wasn't for him. The following year, high-ranking Sicilian Mafia member Salvatore Maranzano arrived in America and became accepted into the already established Castelmarice family operating in Brooklyn. He became acquainted with Joe Bonanno and took the young man under his wing. Bonanno then became an enforcer for the up-and-coming mobster. Bonanno's cousin, Stefano Magladino, was also part of this family, but he was forced to flee Brooklyn and went to Buffalo, New York in 1917 to avoid a murder charge. By 1922, he became the boss of what would be known as the Buffalo Crime Family. Bonanno's cousin and Maranzano were powerful connections to have, but during the first few years of his career in organized crime, Bonanno was not yet inducted into the family as a full member. Seeing the fortune his boss was making in Prohibition and himself becoming a little rich from his work, Bonanno decided to invest his capital in his own distillery in Brooklyn. As the business began to make money, it caught the attention of a man named Mimi, who arrived one day demanding a cut of the money because this was his neighborhood. Emboldened from his relationship and experiences with Maranzano, Bonanno stood up to Mimi, who he only knew as a stranger, and the two almost got into a brawl. Unfortunately for Joe, Mimi was a main member of the Castelmarice family, and Joe was not. But lucky for Joe, he had a powerful relative in his cousin Stefano, and a powerful friend in Salvatore Maranzano. While a normal person would be squashed in this situation, a sit-down was granted under the judgment of Vito Bonaverte. Magladino and Maranzano attended and spoke up for Joe. Maranzano argued that while it was Mimi's neighborhood, Joe was his guy, and Mimi should have checked who Joe was with and who he knew before he went in with his demands. Bonverte ruled in favor of Joe and he was allowed to keep his operation. This put Joe in Maranzano's debt, but he didn't mind at all. Shortly after this, Joe Bonanno became a fully made man in the Castelmarice family. In 1930, Joe the Boss Masseria made a power play to control the entire Italian Mafia operating in the United States. He assassinated the Castelmarice boss of the Detroit family, and he intimidated Maranzano's own boss in New York into fleeing the country. To further weaken his rivals, he had powerful Capo Bonverte murdered in an attempt to decapitate the New York family and make them paralyzed. Maranzano rallied the demoralized family to fight back, and he became the new boss. Bonanno became one of his top soldiers in the fighting. The full extent of what he did during those times is unknown as the statute of limitations for murder never expires, and he would not mention it in his autobiography. But we do know that his reputation from what he did during those times made other families reluctant to go to war with him in the 1960s. If you would like to learn more about the details of the Castella Marise War, please check out our earlier videos on the subject. Following the end of the war, his mentor Maranzano was murdered in 1931, and the old system of the boss of bosses was replaced with the commission the equivalent of a board of directors that was meant to share power more equally amongst the groups to prevent another disastrous conflict. Bonanno described the formation of the commission as, We opted for a parliamentary arrangement where a group of the most important men in our world would assume the function formally performed by one man. Bonanno was elected by his family to become the new boss, though he preferred the English word for his title to be father of the family. At the age of 26, it made him the youngest man to assume the title, a record that still exists today. Bonanno claimed in his book that he was unaware of the plan to kill Maranzano and he had nothing to do with it. He claimed he chose peace over revenge because he did not want to put the family members who made him their father into danger again. However, it defies mob logic that Bonanno would remain alive, let alone become the new boss if he was a Maranzano loyalist. Other members loyal to Maranzano were either murdered or forced into retirement following Lucky Luciano's victory. So it seems likely that he had a prior arrangement with the new boss of the Masseria family. Again. Bonanno's book, while being full of valuable information, should not be taken at face value as being honest, as the man's main purpose when writing it was to paint himself in the most flattering light. The rest of the 1930s could be described as the best times in Bonanno's life. In 1931, just two months after his mentor Maranzano was murdered, Joe Bonanno married Fela Labruzzo, and the two would be together for almost 50 years until her death in 1980. They would have three children, the oldest was Salvatore, who was also called Bill, and the others were Catherine and Joseph Charles Jr. The family split their time between a home in Hempstead, New York, and a vacation farm in Middletown. In the 1940s, Bill suffered from a mastoid ear infection at age 10, and was told that living in a drier climate would be better for his health. He was sent to a Catholic boarding school in Tucson, Arizona, and the family purchased property there so that they could come and visit him whenever they could. In addition to being the boss, or as he preferred father, to one of the five major New York crime families, Bonanno was also the owner of many legitimate businesses that included garment factories, cheese making, trucking, and a funeral home that some speculated doubled as a way of disposing of murdered bodies. In 1945, he became a U.S. citizen. The only legal issues he had up to this point was a fine for labor violations at one of his companies. 
During the 1940s, the political makeup of the commission was what he described as conservative, with Bonanno's views often allying with Frank Costello, Joe Cravacci, Vincent Mangano, and Tommy Gagliano. He claimed that the original commission opposed immoral enterprises like prostitution and drug trafficking. Later on in his life, he would be described as instrumental in the mass importation of heroin from Europe to America. While this was never proven in a court of law, it is another example of why his book should not be taken at its word. As time went on, the conservatives began to dwindle in their numbers. Vincent Mangano disappeared in 1951 and is presumed to have been murdered by his underboss, Albert Anatasia, who ended up being his replacement. While Anatasia leaned conservative, he was a bit of a hot-headed wildcard with his temper. In 1953, Tommy Gagliano died from what is thought to have been natural causes, and he was replaced by his underboss, Tommy Lucchese. He was another veteran of the Castelmarice War, but his views differed from the other members. While in the Luciano family, former underboss Vito Genovese returned to New York from Italy, where he was laying low to avoid murder charges. His return came with a conspiracy to take Costello out so that he could become the new boss. Some of his collaborators included Tommy Lucchese and Anastasia family capo Carlo Gambino. In 1957, they made their moves. On May 2nd, gunman Vincent Gingante tried to shoot Costello in the head and barely missed. The attempt was enough to spook Costello into retirement and it cleared the way for Genovese to become the new boss. On October 25th, Anastasia was murdered as he got a haircut in the Park Central Hotel. This opened up the position to Carlo Gambino and he became the new Don. Suddenly, Bonanno and his fellow boss Joe Provacci found themselves as a minority faction. The two remaining original Dons became even closer when Bonanno's son Bill married Provacci's niece Rosalia in 1956. The November 1957 Appalachia meeting's purpose was to inform the other families across the nation of the way things now stood in New York with the new bosses. Instead, it was interrupted by a police raid which exposed the nation to how vast and organized the criminals in America really were. Bonanno denied ever being at this meeting, but one of his family's high-ranking capos, Gaspar Di Gregio, was picked up by police and he had Bonanno's driver's license on him. Bonanno claimed that Di Gregio only had his ID because he asked him to pick it up as a favor. But the police dispute this story and claim that Bonanno was there, ran away, and didn't get caught. Also in 1957, Bonanno embarked on a family vacation to Italy, where he brought along his underboss, Carmine Galante. Law enforcement believes that this vacation doubled as a business trip, where the men laid down the foundation for their network to import heroin and other drugs into the United States, despite Bonanno denying that he was ever in the trade. In 1959, what became known as the First Colombo War broke out, which pitted boss Joe Provacci against the Gallo brothers. While this family was killing each other, Joe Bonanno was attempting to consolidate his own power. Around 1954, his son Bill graduated from college, and immediately he was inducted into the crime family. After a few years, he was promoted to the family's consigliere position, which caused resentment among the other men in the family who had been there for decades. Joe intended to groom his son to be the next boss, and while the old man was still in power, no one dared to openly challenge him. In 1962, Joe Provacci passed away from cancer while his family was still at war. His underboss, Joe Magliocho, took the throne. He suspected that the Gallows were secretly being backed by Gambino and Lucchese, so he approached Bonanno and the two formed an alliance. With the Genovese family being weakened due to their boss's recent imprisonment, they were going to assassinate Gambino and Lucchese. The two would then become the new bosses of the whole underworld and control it together. They were also going to take out Bonanno's cousin, Buffalo family boss Stefano Magladino. Bonanno claimed that his older cousin became jealous of his success and was becoming hostile. The plan for the executions blew up when the man assigned to do the dirty work, Joe Colombo, betrayed his superiors and exposed the scheme to the commission. Magliocho came clean about his involvement and was forced into retirement, and shortly after that he passed away from health complications. Magliocho threw Bonanno under the bus before his death, and in turn, the commission summoned him to answer for his involvement. On October 21st, 1964, Bonanno's attorney watched him being forced into a car by two mysterious men, where he then disappeared. Government wiretaps of other Mafia members yielded that the other families had no clue where he went, while his own men were fuming that he abandoned them. In his absence, his son Bill assumed the title of boss, and longtime loyal capo Gaspar de Greggio launched a rebellion that the press would dub the Banana War. The commission backed de Greggio in the war, but Bill and his loyalist faction refused to back down. In early 1966, de Greggio reached out to Bill to arrange a peace meeting. On January 28th, Bill showed up at the agreed address on Troutman Street in Brooklyn, where an ambush was waiting. There were shots fired, but no one was wounded or killed. On May 17th of that year, Joe Bonanno mysteriously returned to New York and turned himself into authorities. He claimed he was kidnapped by his jealous cousin Stefano Magladino, but was eventually released and laid low in Arizona, fearing for his own safety. The war continued on until 1968 when DeGregorio was wounded by machine gun fire. 
The commission was worried that he was not up to the task to lead a unified family, and they shifted their support to Paul Sayaka to become the new leader. Later that year, Bonanno suffered from a heart attack and the near-death experience left him shaken. Bonanno agreed to a truce that allowed him and Bill to walk away and leave New York for Arizona. And so, the last original boss on the commission went into retirement. The two would keep low profiles and largely stay out of trouble, but they were constantly watched by the FBI who refused to believe that they were really out of the game. In 1983, Bonanno entered the spotlight again when he released a memoir about his life called A Man of Honor. While many Mafia members were horrified with his move to go public, he did not see himself as breaking his code of omerta because he was not becoming a government witness or informant. This was a view that he seemed to be alone in having. Besides the Mafia and the general public, his memoir also attracted the attention of another group, the government. Wiretaps picked up Mafia members discussing the commission before, but no one was really sure of what it was until his book was released and the missing puzzle pieces were filled in. He was later brought forward by authorities to explain his past under oath and refused. In 1983, he served eight months in prison for obstruction of justice. In 1985, he served another 14 months for contempt of court. He was well into his 80s when he was released. The rest of his life was peaceful and quiet. He passed away in 2002 at the age of 97 and now rests eternally in Tucson, Arizona. The truly powerful people usually act behind the scenes to direct and manipulate events without the public ever really knowing who they are. In the criminal underworld, Gaetano Gagliano was like that. If you had to judge the success of a mafia boss based on his ability to avoid public recognition and law enforcement scrutiny, then Gagliano was the biggest winner in La Cosa Nostra. Very little is known about his life, with the overwhelming majority being before he became the head of one of New York's five families and turned it into a powerhouse. He is mentioned in only one newspaper account during his lifetime, and it made no report about his ties to organized crime. Instead, the headline was, Four Bronx Men Draw Tax Evasion Penalties, and it appeared at the bottom of page 10 in the New York Times. We know from immigration records that he was born on May 29, 1883 in Corleone, Sicily. In 1905, he immigrated to the United States, and he would go on to adopt the English name of Tommy after settling down in New York. He married Josephine Pamela, but it's unknown if they had any children. According to the 1925 New York State Census, there were no children living with them. His occupation there was listed as a building contractor, and both he and his wife became naturalized American citizens that year. He was part of many legitimate businesses, but they were all tied together by one thing, his involvement with Tom Rina's family. Rina was once a capo in the Morello crime family, but during the chaos of the 1910s, he split away and formed his own family in the Bronx. Sometime prior to 1930, Gagliano became Rina's underboss. Another powerful member of this group was Tommy Lucchese. Gagliano used his power as a mobster to influence his legitimate business dealings. For example, in 1928 he formed the Plasterers Information Bureau. Local contractors were invited to become part of this organization for a fee, and if they dared to decline, they would later be paid a visit by some very strong men looking to rough them up. In 1929, the Rina family's independence was called into question by Joe the Boss Masseria, as he sought to conquer and consolidate the entire Italian-American underworld with himself at the top. This prompted Rina to consider allying with Salvatore Maranzano. When Masseria heard of this, he ordered Rina to be murdered. It's speculated that Vito Genovese was the gunman that took his life on February 26, 1930. Masseria passed underboss Gagliano over and installed outsider Fat Joe Pinzola to be the family's new boss. This enraged the membership, but Gagliano decided it would be best to accept this for now and bide his time. Not much is known about Fat Joe, except that he seemed to be universally disliked by many. Here's what Lucky Luciano said of the man. As big a shit as Masseria was, he didn't hold a candle to Pinzolo. That guy was fatter, uglier, and dirtier than Masseria was on the worst day when the old bastard didn't take a bath, which was most of the time. In the summer of 1930, the Castelmarice War broke out. On September 5th, Fat Joe's body was discovered at 1487 Broadway, in an office that was being leased by Tommy Lucchese. Lucchese was arrested for the murder, but the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence. Gagliano then seized command of the family, and they switched allegiance from Masseria to Maranzano. According to Mafia turncoat Joe Valacci, Gagliano and his allies knew how to earn money, and they supplied most of the funds for Maranzano to carry out his war. Following Maranzano's victory, Gagliano was recognized as the official head of the Rina family, and it was renamed in his honor. Gagliano and his new underboss Lucchese were involved in Lucky Luciano's conspiracy to murder Maranzano in September 1931. Following that event, the commission was formed and Gagliano received a seat on the Mafia's board of directors. 1932 appears to be the last year where there was any definitive information about him. In May of that year, he was sentenced to 15 months in the Atlanta Penitentiary for tax evasion. During this time, Al Capone was also staying there as a guest of the government. Joe Valacci claimed that Gagliano attended his wedding that July before he reported to prison. Valacci's wife Carmela was one of Tom Rina's daughters. Aside from two photos of Gagliano, we also have the physical description that Valacci gave of the man. He was a big tall guy, a little bald. He looked like a businessman. 
After his release from prison, he dropped off the radar. Joe Bonanno mentioned him in his autobiography, but after the events of the Castelmorese War, he is only referred to as a fellow father of a family who had conservative views. Bonanno mentioned that Gagliano was on the commission until 1953, when Lucchese took his place. Gagliano's exact date of death is disputed, but it is believed to have been February 16, 1951, according to Lucchese's testimony during the organized crime Senate hearings. It has been speculated by journalist and mafia expert Sylvan Robb that Gagliano became sick with a heart condition in the 1930s and handed control to Lucchese, but this conflicts with Bonanno's recollection in his memoir. The truth about Gagliano's tenure as boss is obscure, and anyone that knew any of the details is now long dead. Even Gagliano's own mausoleum in the Bronx does not list a date of death. But we could be certain that Gagliano stayed in the shadows after his release from prison, while Tommy Lucchese ran the day-to-day -day operations with himself becoming the new boss during the early 1950s. And Gagliano's achievement of becoming a faceless boss to a powerful crime organization makes him probably the most successful Don in America's La Cosa Nostra. John Gotti and the Gambino crime family might be the most well-known names in the American Mafia. That family was taken over by Carlo Gambino in 1957 when then-boss Albert Anastasia was assassinated at a barbershop on Park Avenue in one of the most famous mob hits ever known. But before these men, the family was led silently by boss Vincent Mangiano. He was appointed by Lucky Luciano when the Modern Mafia was founded in 1931 and he ruled for 20 years. Despite being one of the original bosses of the five families, almost nothing is known about his long reign, which is the way he would have wanted it. Don Vincenzo was born in Sicily on March 28, 1888. It's unclear of when he exactly immigrated to the United States, but by the time the Castelmorese War broke out in 1930, he was already a high-ranking member of the Menino family, with his power concentrated at the Brooklyn waterfront. He controlled the longshoremen through Anthony Anastasio, president of their union and fellow member of the family. Goods could not be loaded or unloaded from ships without under-the-table payments. Mangano's life is only known to us through fragments, and the biggest piece comes from former Bonanno family boss and founder, Joseph Bonanno. Mangiano was first mentioned in the Castelmorese War. During the war, Mangiano's boss, Frank Scalisi, was a Marizano loyalist, and he was forced into retirement when Lucky Luciano became the ultimate victor and Mangiano was selected to replace him. The heads of the newly formed families became permanent members of the commission, a board of directors for the organized crime world created to prevent any wars from ever happening again. In the 1930s, the commission had its first test when several members wanted to eliminate special prosecutor Thomas Dewey, while others were opposed. Bonanno recalled Mangiano's position to be, if we lose our heads, then we'll wind up burning down our foundation. The hit on Dewey never happened. Bonanno also recalled that Mangano was the mafia member who coined the term La Cosa Nostra, which means our thing. Mangano was one of the oldest members of the commission, and he was in his 60s by the time his reign ended. He was more old-fashioned than his American counterparts, and felt that American culture was corrupting the traditional values of Cosa Nostra. While some newspapers gave Mangano the nickname of the Executioner, his longtime underboss Albert Anastasia was known as the Lord High Executioner. Anastasia ran what was called Murder Inc., the enforcement arm of the mob, and this got him close to the other bosses in the families, something that Mangano viewed as subversive. By the time the 1950s came, Mangano was already seeing himself as an old man, according to Bonanno. This was perceived as weakness by Anatasia, and the two men started having more and more conflicts with some accounts that they almost got into physical fights. The final straw for Mangano that his underboss was going rogue was when Anatasia became close with the Luciano family boss, Frank Costello, and the two men started doing business together behind Mangano's back. According to Joe Bonanno, fear is when you think ahead about what may happen to you. Fear is anticipating the future and assuming the worst possible scenario. Each man felt the other would act first. Each wanted to be the first to act. On April 19th, 1951, Anastasia acted first. The body of Don Vincenzo's brother Philip was discovered in a Brooklyn marsh with three bullets in his head. He was the consigliere of the family. Don Vincenzo disappeared on the same day as well, but his body was never found. Ten years later, he was declared legally dead. Anastasia would never confirm or deny the role he played in Mangano's demise. But Don Vincenzo's death broke the rule that bosses cannot be murdered without commission approval. However, his elimination was the result of politics, and so the commission looked the other way as everyone found something that they could benefit from with him no longer there. Out of the five families of New York City, the Colombo family is the newest. 
with its existence being recognized by the other families in a 1928 organized crime meeting held at Cleveland. It was founded by Joe Provacci. Born in 1897 on the island of Sicily, he is rumored to have family ties with the Mafia base there. He did some time in an Italian prison and was released in 1921, after which he immediately set out for America with the dream to become a legitimate businessman in Chicago with his own bakery and grocery store. The business failed and in 1925 he relocated to Brooklyn. In the 1920s, bootlegging was an industry where the bold could make a quick fortune, and Provacci joined the many other enterprising men of his generation who decided to break the law by making and selling what the public demanded. But to make it in this business, you need to be tough, so that's what Provacci became. He formed his own gang while also starting a front business as an importer of olive oil, a detail that would later be imitated in the Godfather novel and movies. The 1928 meeting in Cleveland was called to peacefully distribute the territory in Brooklyn that once belonged to assassinated mobsters Frankie Yale and Salvatore D'Aquila. Provacci attended with his number two lieutenant Joseph Magliocho, and they were granted a piece of the newly opened territory. They were given Bensonhurst, Carroll Gardens, Bay Ridge, and Red Hook, while the rest of Brooklyn was given to Joe the Boss Masseria. During the Castella Marise War, Provacci managed to keep his family neutral and out of the fighting. Because they were the newest family, they were and still are the smallest, with an estimated 110 full members. This is in contrast with the Genovese family, who has an estimated 300 made members. Despite his neutrality, the Provacci family was too large to ignore, and they received a seat on the Mafia's newly formed commission. The next three decades, leading up to 1957, were really the golden years for the American Mafia, as they faded away from public memory and ran their empires in secret, with many people, including J. Edgar Hoover, denying they even existed. During this time, Provacci went from doing well to being extremely wealthy. He lived in a large house in Bensonhurst and had a second home in Miami, Florida, along with a 322-acre estate in New Jersey that once belonged to former President Teddy Roosevelt. While he made most of his money from illegal activities, his olive oil empire was also thriving, especially after the Second World War, earning him the nickname Olive Oil King. He owned about 20 other businesses and provided jobs to hundreds of New Yorkers. He was also a devout Catholic by appearance and was a member of the Knights of Columbus. His estate had its own church and he invited priests to come and celebrate Mass with him. In 1952, jewels were stolen from the Brooklyn church he belonged to. He had his men hunt down the thief and strangle him to death with a rosary as punishment. While the government did not believe that the National Crime Syndicate really existed, law enforcement knew that businessman Joe Provacci was secretly a gangster. In 1953, the IRS tried to go after Provacci for unpaid taxes like they did with Al Capone. Failing to obtain a criminal indictment, they then tried to sue him and the $1.5 million they claimed he owed was never paid. In 1954, the State Department tried to have his citizenship revoked and have him deported back to Italy because he lied about his criminal record on his immigration paperwork. They lost the case on appeal in 1960 and Provacci got to stay. The government also had his phones tapped. In 1956, a conversation between him and Sicilian mafioso Antonio Catone was recorded about exporting Italian oranges to the United States. In 1959, one of the shipments was stopped by customs and they discovered 90 wax oranges that were full of Turkish heroin. Provacci was never charged. Provacci attended the disastrous 1957 Appalachia Conference. And just like how this day brought an end to the mob's golden age, it also marked the beginning of the end for Provacci. He, along with 21 other men, was convicted of criminal conspiracy and sentenced to five years in prison. He later appealed this ruling and it was thrown out in 1960. But while Provacci became filthy rich during his rule and had a reputation for generosity with family and the church, his own rank and file began to resent him. Provacci enforced an old Sicilian custom in his family that all members and associates needed to pay a monthly fee to him. The purpose of this money was to create a fund to support the families of mobsters that were doing time in prison, but it was rumored that Provacci was also keeping a fat cut for himself. Despite being the founder and a self-made man, many younger mobsters resented him as stingy and greedy. Provacci also did not tolerate any dissent and had no qualms about murdering anyone who was in disagreement with him. But as he got older, he became to be perceived by his men as disloyal to the crew, which made his empire possible. The first high-ranking member to turn against him was Capo regime Frank Abbott Marco. Abbott Marco had run different illegal gambling operations, one of which was a lucrative numbers lottery. In 1959, Abbott Marco stopped paying his tribute to Provacci. On November 5th, the Capo was assassinated by multiple gunmen as he left a tavern in Brooklyn. It was said that the murder was committed by the Gallo brothers, and they were promised Abbott Marco's rackets as their reward. 
But instead of giving it to them, Provacci did not keep his word. In response to this, the Gallo crew rebelled and the First Columbo War broke out. In 1961, the Gallo brothers, Joe, Albert, and Larry, allied with future boss Carmine Persico to kidnap the family's top leadership and demanded that they would only be released after a more favorable money-sharing scheme was adopted. They captured underboss Joseph Magliocho, Provacci's brother Frank, and two capos. Meanwhile, Provacci eluded them by hiding in Florida. Consigliere Charles Lociero negotiated their release in peace terms, but Provacci had no intention to follow through with his promises. He turned Carmine Persico to his side and ordered the execution of the Gallos. Persico tried to murder Larry Gallo by strangling him in a bar, but by chance a policeman entered and the attempt was foiled. But this did earn Persico the nickname of the snake, and the scene was also repeated in The Godfather Part II. But the surprise attempt to take out the Gallos failed, and Provacci's word no longer believed by a significant portion of his men. The war resumed with greater intensity. It brought attention to the entire mafia from law enforcement and the public, which made it bad for everyone's business. In 1962, fellow commission members Carlo Gambino and Tommy Lucchese tried to get Provacci to find a way to end the war. But Provacci was suspicious and felt that these two were back in the gallows in an attempt to force him out and take over his family. Before he could see the end of the war through, he passed away from liver cancer on June 6, 1962. During this time, Provacci and Joe Bonanno were the only original members from the start of the commission still on it, and both families were allied with each other. After he died, his long-term underboss, Joseph Magliocho, took his place at the top. Convinced that Lucchese and Gambino were secretly working with the Gallos, Magliocho and Bonanno hatched a scheme to take out these two bosses who they saw as opposition. The contract was given to the family's best hitman, Capo Regime Joe Colombo. Colombo knew that there was a rule against murdering bosses, and he decided that he wasn't going to be the one to cross that line. Instead, he went to the targeted commission members and told them about the plot. They deduced that Bonanno was the mastermind and both men were summoned to the commission to answer for their crime. Bonanno decided to run and fake his own kidnapping, knowing that he was going to be murdered, while Magliocho came clean and confessed. His health was failing and he didn't have long to live. The commission made him pay a $50,000 fine for his treachery and forced him into retirement. He passed away the following year. As a reward, Joseph Colombo was made the new boss, and with his ascent, the war with the Gallows ended for now. He would be the first New York boss to be born in America and not Italy. And from this point, the Vivacci family became known as the Colombo family. When we think about La Cosa Nostra, we associate their organized crime with large cities like New York, Chicago, and Las Vegas. But just 300 miles east of the Big Apple is Buffalo, New York. And the crime family based here controls a vast swath of territory that extends from Ohio into Canada. And for more than 50 years, it was run by one of the most powerful bosses in America, Stefano Magadino. Known as The Undertaker, Magadino was born October 10, 1891 in the Castelmarice del Golfo region of Sicily. His family there was part of a mafia clan, and when war broke out in 1902, the 11-year-old was sent to live in America for his own safety. He settled in Brooklyn and fell in with the recently formed Castelmarice crime family. This group would later evolve into the Bonanno family. In August of 1921, a man by the name of Bartolo Fontana turned himself into New York police, saying that he was responsible for murdering Camilo Caioso a few weeks earlier in New Jersey. He claimed that he was pressured to do this for the Good Killers. The Good Killers was made up of several members of the Castelmarice family, and Caioso was killed in retaliation for the murder of Magadino's brother in Sicily back in 1916. Fontana did the crime because he feared that if he didn't, they would kill him. Now he was afraid that he's going to be murdered for being a loose end. The police set up a sting operation where Fontana told Magadino that he needed to leave town because the cops were on him. But first, he needed money to go on the lam. Magadino agreed and they met at Grand Central Station where $30 was exchanged. Magadino was then arrested and held in custody, but New Jersey declined to charge him with conspiracy to commit murder and he was released. After this, he fled to Buffalo to lay low, and he became linked up with the crime family there, who was also from Castelmarice del Golfo. Magadino quickly rose to the family's ranks, and when boss Joseph De Carlo died in 1922, Magadino succeeded him. In the 1920s, Magadino's legitimate business was operating a funeral home in Niagara Falls. He lived in the small town of Lewiston with his wife Carmela and their four children. His son Peter would go on to become a maid member of the family, while his three daughters all married maid men as well. He was also one of the richest mobsters during Prohibition, with the location of his territory next to Canada, giving him an advantage to smuggle liquor into the country. During the Castelmarice War, he was targeted for assassination by Joe the Boss Masseria, but there was little fighting in western New York because Magadino kept tight control of his empire. He was able to funnel money and supplies to Salvatore Maranzano in New York, who was working with his cousin, Joseph Bonanno. The war ended in 1931, when Lucky Luciano murdered Maranzano and created the commission. 
Magadino was given a seat on the board. As Prohibition ended, he diversified his family into gambling, loan sharking, labor racketeering, and other traditional mob activities. He was an old-style boss that preferred to be insulated and out of the spotlight. During the 30s and 40s, many people did not know who he was and were ignorant of the power he wielded. He presided over a golden age for his family, where they also diversified into many legitimate businesses as well. He survived two assassination attempts, one in 1936 where his sister was killed, and the other in 1958. It was after the Appalachia meeting that law enforcement and the public started to become aware of Magadino and his organization. Investigations, along with the testimony of Joe Valachi, revealed him to the public to be the center of Buffalo's organized crime. As the law tightened their surveillance, the family's revenues dropped as a result. Between 1962 and 1968, the funeral home he owned was bugged, with the FBI having over 76,000 pages of transcripts regarding the business discussed there. As a result, Don Stefano and six other people were arrested and charged with crimes related to gambling and racketeering. The charges were later dropped due to a judge ruling that the wiretaps were illegal and inadmissible. But these events tipped off the organization that they were under the microscope. Everyone in the family remained tight-lipped and discreet, but in 1968, an FBI search of Magadino's son's apartment found $521,000 in cash hidden in a suitcase. This fostered some resentment in the rank and file that the boss had been staying fat while everyone else starved. He was in his mid-70s at this point, and despite law enforcement's insistence that the raid started to tear the family apart, they stayed together and remained strong. Magadino continued his reign into the 1970s without being charged with any crimes. He died of a heart attack on July 19, 1974, at the age of 82. Al Capone no doubt holds the title as the most famous American gangster of the 20th century. As public enemy number one, he was the poster boy for organized crime during the Prohibition years, with his personality being the inspiration for the first characters in the gangster movie genre. As the undisputed boss of the Chicago outfit at the end of the Castel Marise War, his power and prominence earned him a seat on Lucky Luciano's original commission. At the time, he was the only American-born boss in the Italian Mafia, with his contemporaries making the move across the ocean when they were young men or children. Alphonse Capone was born on January 17, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York to Italian immigrants Gabriel and Teresa. He spent his early years living in the Navy Yard section and when he was 11 his family moved to Park Slope. His parents had nine children in total. His brothers Ralph and Frank followed him to Chicago and were part of his criminal empire. In contrast, his older brother James later changed his name to Richard Hart and worked as a prohibition agent in Nebraska. This was done to hide his Italian heritage and come off as more American, as he started working for the government and changed his name before his brother's rise to fame. As a student, he displayed intelligence and prominence, but at the age of 14, he was expelled after hitting a female teacher. He worked various odd jobs to make ends meet, and in 1916, he began to play semi-professional baseball for two years. During this period, he met the gangster Johnny Torrio, and the older man became his mentor. In 1918, when he was just 19 years old, he married Mae Joseph Coughlin, who was Irish-American. That same year, she gave birth to their only child, Albert Francis Capone, who would later become deaf. As an adult, Al Jr. tried to distance himself from his father's legacy. Capone floated between various small New York gangs before he became a member of the Five Points. In addition to Torrio, another mentor for him was the gangster Frankie Yale. One night, Capone was working as a bouncer at one of Yale's clubs and insulted a woman. Her upset brother attacked Capone with a knife and slashed his face three times. Following this incident, he was given the nickname Scarface. When asked about it later in life, he would lie and say it was wounds he earned from World War I, a conflict in which he did not actually serve in. In 1919, Big Jim Colissimo was a large crime boss in Chicago, with his specialization being prostitution and brothels. Big Jim brought Johnny Torrio into his empire to work as an enforcer. Torrio, in turn, then brought his protege, Capone, out west with him, and he started working as a bouncer in one of the brothels. It was during this time that historians believe Capone contracted syphilis from one of the working girls. Capone also worked as a boxing promoter at the time, most likely fixing the fights. Prohibition began on January 17, 1920, and small-time gangsters all across the country recognized that with Americans still having a demand for booze, there was a large black market just waiting to be served. But Big Jim didn't want to be any part of this new business, and he forbade his men from participating as well. On May 11th of that year, he was murdered and Johnny Torrio became the new boss of the Chicago outfit. Al Capone's position rose with his mentor, and he went from being a low-level soldier to becoming a trusted lieutenant. During this time, the gangs of Chicago did not strictly discriminate from letting outside ethnic groups into their ranks. Johnny Torrio's empire was therefore mostly Italian with some Irish, Germans, and other groups, while Dean O'Banion's Northside gang was mostly Irish with some Italian-Americans in their rank as well. Torrio tried the rule by avoiding violence and making compromises. But in 1924, he was forced into a situation where this strategy wasn't going to work. 
O'Banion felt that his territory was being invaded by Torio allies and he sought out Torio to make a peaceful settlement. But when he didn't like what Torio proposed, he made it clear that he was going to take matters into his own hands. On November 10th, O'Banion was murdered in his flower shop, with the order being given by Torio. But rather than scare the Northside gang into submission, this event galvanized them to fight back. In January 1925, Capone survived an attempted hit that left him unhurt but shaken. Johnny Torrio was not so lucky. Less than two weeks later, he was shot and severely wounded. Though he survived, he decided that he was not suited to fight in a gang war and chose to retire, naming Capone as his successor. Torrio built a criminal empire that was composed of illegal breweries and distilleries, transportation networks, and a massive distribution platform combined with political and law enforcement protection through corruption. And while the former boss took an approach that avoiding violence and staying low-key was the best policy, Capone was a total opposite. He was going to use brute force to increase his power and revenue. He used a simple formula to expand his distribution. A speakeasy would be told that he needed to be their new supplier. If they refused, he blew them up. It's estimated that about 100 people were killed during the 1920s because of this tactic. He opened brothels and new clubs that employed local black musicians to perform jazz. As the money rolled in, he purchased custom suits, smoked expensive cigars, and was often in the company of beautiful women that were not his wife. But as his fortunes grew, so did his feud with the North Side, and it became dangerous for him to be based in the city. He relocated his headquarters to the neighboring suburb of Cicero, where he used his wealth to buy off the local government and insulate himself in what essentially became a private kingdom. But the feud continued with both sides trying to kill the other's leadership, and people caught in the crossfire included Capone's personal driver who was found tortured and murdered, along with Capone's non-gangster friend who owned a local restaurant. In 1927, a second war was opened on Capone by a local gangster named Joe Aiello over a small insult that grew out of hand. Aiello created a confederation of Capone's enemies to take the boss down. On one occasion, he offered the chef at a restaurant Capone frequently ate at $10,000 to poison the Chicago boss. The chef refused and he then alerted Capone to the plot, who retaliated by shooting up a bakery that belonged to his rival. That summer, Aiello offered $25,000 to anyone who murdered Capone. A number of hitmen tried and were killed for their troubles. The price was then raised to $50,000 and at least 10 men tried and died for their efforts. A Capone ally named Ralph Sheldon tried to take this offer, but his treachery was discovered by Frank Nitti and he was shot in front of a hotel on the west side. In November, Aiello decided to do things himself and assembled a small army of men with machine guns to wait outside of a cigar shop that Capone frequented so they could ambush him. When the boss learned of this, he alerted the police and the men were all arrested. He then sent his own men to wait outside at the police station to kill Aiello when he came out. This plan was abandoned when reporters began to show up so they could witness the hit as it unfolded. After this, tensions between the two cooled a little. Meanwhile, the war at the north side was still going on. Gradually, the leadership of this group was thinned out through assassinations, and in 1929, Bugs Moran was the last man standing that was in charge. Capone's men spied on Moran and his remaining associates to learn their daily habits. They seemed to always visit the same parking garage, so on February 14th, 1929, the group made their move. They disguised themselves as police officers and pretended to arrest the men. As they lined them up against the wall, they shot them all with machine guns. Seven men were killed and the brazen ruthlessness of this event shocked the public and finally tarnished Capone's image. Also devastating was that Moran was not with the group that day, and now the conflict would continue with Capone under greater public scrutiny. Meanwhile, Aiello still worked behind the scenes to have someone in Capone's organization betray him. Capone's bodyguard, Frank Rio, uncovered a plot where three of his men planned a defect. Capone is said to have brutally beaten the men with a baseball bat and then ordered them all to be shot. He then went all out to eliminate Aiello. He sent men to Buffalo and Rochester to hunt him down. In the end, Aiello was found to be laying low in Chicago. On October 23, 1930, he was ambushed and killed by an assassin wielding a machine gun as he walked from the building he was hiding in to a car. Events like this were extreme public displays of violence that disgusted many and gave the appearance that one of America's largest cities was corrupt and lawless. As the local police seemed unwilling or incapable of stopping him, the federal government, under the direction of President Herbert Hoover, stepped in. Capone now faced a two-prong attack from the national government, with the Justice Department after his bootlegging operations and the Treasury after him for tax evasion. On May 27, 1929, he made his first federal court appearance at Philadelphia, where he was charged with contempt of court because he faked an illness to avoid an earlier appearance. He pled guilty and was sentenced to one year at Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. He was released after nine months, and his brother Ralph ran the outfit in his absence. Following his release, pressure from law enforcement intensified, with multiple charges of perjury and vagrancy. The government was throwing anything at him in the hope that something would stick. In 1931, he was charged with over 5,000 violations of the Volstead Act, which meant that he was illegally selling alcohol on a large scale, along with tax evasion. He worked out a plea bargain with prosecutors for two and a half years in prison, but the judge rejected it. Capone withdrew his guilty plea and they went to trial. On October 17th, he was found guilty and sentenced to 11 years in prison. 
Salvatore Maranzano was murdered on September 10th of that year. In the aftermath of this, the commission was formed and Capone was given a seat as the boss of Chicago. But due to his legal problems, he never got to sit in it. However, his successor, Frank Nitti, did. At the age of 33, Capone began his sentence in the Atlanta Penitentiary, where he was officially diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea. Capone's health deteriorated and he became withdrawn and mentally aloof. This made him a target for bullying by some of the prisoners, but other prisoners stepped in and protected him because of his reputation. There were accusations of special treatment and in 1934 he was transferred to Alcatraz. On November 16, 1939, he was released from prison due to his failing health. He moved to his Palm Beach mansion in Florida and saw various doctors in the hope that they could cure him. But all they were able to do was to slow down his deterioration. A 1946 medical examination concluded that he now had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old. On January 21st, 1947, he suffered from a stroke, and on the next day he had a heart attack. He died four days later, surrounded by his family on January 25th. When Public Enemy No. 1 was locked up in 1931, the government figured that the Chicago outfit was dealt a crippling blow that it would never recover from with its leader being taken out. Instead, Capone's underboss, Frank Nitti, took the reins. The outfit still operated, but was low-key, and if it used violence, it was never in public. 25 years later, the FBI was shocked when they discovered an underworld organization ruling Chicago that was led by former Capone lieutenants.